My name is Brenda DeVasti and I'm the Director of Imaging at Mon Health Medical Center in Morgantown, West Virginia. And I've been a manager for 20 years and in imaging for 35 years. Here's a picture of my husband and me. Um, we've been married for 35 years and this was our 30 year wedding anniversary. We just celebrated our 35 this past April. And he is my rock, just had to include him. You'll see him around here. Here's a picture of my two children, Cody and Megan. Cody is a bartender server in Orlando, and he actually came to Orlando, uh, met a girl, went back home, came back down again, and he's been here for two years now. And here is my daughter, Megan, and she's just finished up a year of travel nursing. She was all over the place. She started in um, Yale, New Haven, Connecticut. Then she went over to um, Oregon. She was there for six months. And then she just went down to North Carolina for six months and she was um, in a COVID unit and she was got lots of money, came back, um, spent her hard, hard earned cash. She just bought a house in, in May, just closed on it. So I'm very proud of, of her achievement. So here's my dog, Zoe. This is the love of my life. Don't tell my husband or my family. <laughs> <laughs> she is half Havanese and half Poodle, so she's a Havapoo. And she just brings me so much joy. So I had to include her also. Here's a picture from 2019, whenever we were at ICE in Clearwater, Florida, and this just looks like a postcard, so I had to include it. So my disclosures, I have no conflict of interest, but I have to explain that I am not a medical physician. I am not a therapist. I'm not giving you any medical advice whatsoever. So when I talk about resiliency, it is from my own personal experience. I'm not giving you any advice whatsoever. My opinions are solely my opinions and do not reflect anyone else. And then some of the information that I'm gonna to share today is very personal, so if I get emotional, it's okay. Just give me a second and I will be resilient and get through it. Objectives, um, to learn what resilience is, discuss stressful situations that leaders undergo, learn how to use stressful events to become stronger and more approachable with your team, and then also just to learn how to be more resilient. So who wants to just define resilience for me? No, I wanna hear what y'all think resilience is. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So here are four um, definitions that I found and they're pretty much what you said. It's toughness, um, the ability to spring back up, elasticity the ability to recover readily from illness, depression, adversity, or the like, and then also to flourish, and then the ability to bend and not break. I think that one's my favorite. So a modern definition of resilience is, is advancing despite adversity. So just a quick, what's advancing? It could be your goal, whatever you're gonna, you're learning how to play piano. Um, you're gonna go for a degree despite what's in your way, and adversity could be anything, I forgot where I parked my car, it could, be, it could be I lost my keys. It could be something, a small challenge, or it could be something that's very big. And I might be showing my age here, but how many people can remember the Weebles? The Weebles waddle, but they don't fall down. A proper room makes Weeble toys. Yeah, so. <laughs> I love Weebles. <laughs> so I was not able to find Weebles to bring. But, oh, um, so I did find these. They're my, my version of, of Weeble. So who wants to be a, a tester for me? You wanna test? Okay, anybody else wanna test? Anybody else? Sure, okay. So what I want you to do is just to knock these things around and do your best to make them not come back up. No luck, right? Oh, well, you're holding it down. That doesn't count. <laughs> So what do you notice about them? They do, they do. They have a mind of their own, right? Nothing can like discourage them from standing upright unless you physically hold them down like you did. Um, what can we learn from them? Yeah, some of us have that lower shape here, you know. But what we can learn also is we should have that, uh, we wanna get back up. We have to have that drive. And then what keeps us from being like them? Obviously we have minds of our own, but what's the biggest probably hold back from us jumping back up whenever we've had something adverse hit us? A lot of it is up here. It's the mind talk that you're telling yourselves, I don't wanna get back up. I don't know that I should get back up. 
I don't want to I don't want to try it again. So that's the difference between us and them. They don't know any better. So I don't know about you all, but I feel like I've been punched in the face multiple times this past year. Mike Tyson's close quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face is very true. And I thought I should include it here because that is how I felt. And we don't have to provide a plan that works all the time because sometimes the plan just doesn't pan out. With COVID, for example, we had a plan for a disaster. Nobody could have planned for what we just experienced. So the most important thing that we have to remember is the plan that we give our staff has to change on you know, the, the snap of the fingers. You have to figure out how you're gonna change things, but you have to be able to give clarity to your team. So it's not certainty, it's clarity. So I don't know are probably the most important words to use in a time of uncertainty, because if you're making it up, making it up and it's not real, they're gonna see through it. You don't wanna you know, BS your way through it. You wanna actually tell them, I don't know what we're gonna do, but we're gonna figure this out together. We're here, we're gonna, we're gonna do it. It won't work. So how can we give clarity? whenever our plates are so full and we have so many things to do. I don't know about you, but I felt like I can't handle one more thing. And it, it was more of a personal life on top of my you know, work life. So what we have to do is try to figure out how we're gonna get through the day and how we're gonna manage our time because that's a lot of what we're doing. And sometimes you're working in circles. How many of you have heard of TLDR? I know you have, TLDR. Too long, didn't read. How many of you have seen an email just like that one over there and you're like, there is no way I have time for that. So the, the lesson for today is we need to be kind to each other. So if you're sending an email, don't make it look like that. We wanna make sure that we have maybe five bullets, five sentences, and keep it very, very clear. When we're sending something to our team, we've got paragraph after paragraph, they're not gonna read it. They don't have time for it and they're not gonna retain it. So we need to make sure we keep it very simple. And then phone calls are another thing. Whenever you're calling, you wanna give your name and your phone number, and then you give your message, give your name and your phone number again. That way they don't have to listen to it again to be able to get to the, what, you're, what you're saying. PowerPoints for your staff meetings, use very few text, very few writing and more images because that way they're able to focus on what you're saying and they're gonna pay attention. Mark Twain is quoted, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. So why are we not brief? Why is brevity and, and being succinct so, so difficult? It takes a lot of work, a lot of planning. So for us to be resilient and to be clear to our team, we need to make sure that we give less info, bullet points, get, it, get to the point. Plan ahead, you have to narrow down your topics and then work from an outline. So you just wanna, what, are, what am I trying to accomplish today? Edit it condense it, and then make sure that you're setting clear expectations regarding the meeting agenda and sticking to it. If the meeting is supposed to last an hour, it doesn't mean you have to talk the entire hour. Give them back their gift of time. Brevity is a Choice is a book that I've been reading, um, Make a Big Impact by Saying Less. And succeeding and thriving in an attention deficit economy requires leaders to become masters of lean communication. Bottom line, if you wanna succeed, you really need to learn how to be more succinct. What is your non-negotiable standard? We have a lot of them. What, what do you think your non-negotiable standards are? We talked about them in the last meeting we were in, values. What values do you have? You, know, you might have excellence, you might have all these standards that you hold yourself to, but if you can adopt being brief, because a lot of us get very long-winded, that will really help us succeed. And then the bullet point there, get to the point. At the end of the day, how many of us say, oh my goodness, I have so much more to talk about, more things to do, no one does, right? So 50% of meetings are usually not the way that they should be and you're wasting your time 50% of the time, make them 50% shorter. And then handle late arrivals to meetings in person and virtual. So I had a CEO that actually locked the door. If you were late, you didn't get in. So buddy, you were punctual. So you have to set your standards. And then if you're virtual, you know, if you have the chimes on and somebody ding, every time somebody like arrives late, you wanna turn the chimes off and also don't take the time to catch those people up. If they're late, that, that's on them to find out what it is. 
And then if key people aren't present at a meeting, why are we proceeding rehashing the problem when we know that the people who can make decisions aren't there? Cancel the meeting, reschedule it. So what is re resilient leadership is not. They're not fearful or overreactive. They don't predict the future. I don't know is okay, like we said. Not mimicking others. And then not about manipulating employees. You can't lie to them. You have to be transparent and clear. Not about competition. And you, you don't want to have to be first or right. That's not the, the goal here. It is right, but it's not first. <laughs> and then not just about being stubborn or full of grit. So what is resilient leadership? You voluntarily push yourself to do the hard things. You're the first in line to do something that everybody else doesn't want to do because it's too difficult. You perform tasks that cause, creation, cause frustration. You're not afraid to fail or fall. And why is that? Because you see value in failing. You see value in, I can learn what to do and, and overcome this. Resilient people are curious. They ask lots of great questions. They're very flexible. And they are building the plane mid-flight. I like that quote. Um, are hopeful and realistic. They see risk, but they respond out of wisdom. They know their own failures, and they've watched other people fail as well, and they learn from them. So you have to be very watching, watching other people at all times. They're not complainers. They're looking always to be part of the solution, and they need to know how to pivot. So are there any basketball players in the room? Anybody know how to play basketball? Oh, my goodness. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there is, and there's... And there's rules when you're doing that. You're right. Yeah, there's there's goals on each side. So if I'm if I have a basketball in my hand, I have to I have five seconds. I either have to start dribbling and go, or I can actually stand still and I can have one foot planted and this one can pivot. I can look around to see what's going on around me, whether I can shoot to the goal or maybe somebody else is closer and I can throw the ball to them and they're going to get to the goal. So pivoting means for this this scenario. You're keeping your back foot planted in your foundation, in your knowledge, but the pivot foot is the one that's really willing to take risks and try to learn something new. So that's something, pivoting is something you have to do whenever you're resilient. So life does knock us down frequently and we do have to learn how to get back up. So we have to get some perspective. Are we being objective about what's going on? Have we created this horror story in our head that really isn't as bad as what we think it is? Did we overstate the problem? And then we have to compare the unearned, unearned good things in your life to the undeserved bad. So the ratio is 10 to 1, good versus bad. So you already said this, Dr. Nicole, uh, toughen up. That's how we become resilient. We can't take things so personally. We just have to push ourselves. And then don't coddle your team. Teach them how to be more resilient. As parents, we should stop coddling our kids because they have to learn how to overcome adversity. Be the architect of your own fate and be a fighter. So I think about a, a guy that I went to college with that um, he was in his last year, his last semester of college, and he actually rolled a four-wheeler. And whenever he rolled it, it landed on him and he kicked it off with his feet. And when he did that, he uh, fractured L1. And so he was an immediate paraplegic. And he was in the hospital for a long time, had to have surgery. He fought hard. He got so much upper strength, he was able to be self-sufficient, get himself in and out of the wheelchair. He got a truck that had a lift. He was able to finish his last semester. He got his job. He works independently. So here I am. How can you ever say, oh my goodness, my day is so horrible? No, it isn't. Keep the perspective. What are other people, the challenges that they're overcoming daily? They're so much worse. And then another thing is take an honest inventory of your life. So what speed bumps have we put in our own life because we're making poor choices? Maybe you know we're choosing hate versus love. Maybe we're choosing um, to drink or choosing to do drugs or whatever the bad habit is that's putting an obstacle in our life to be very productive at work. So those are things we have to really look at and make sure that you know we're a functional human being and we're very productive. So how can we help leaders who report to us? How are your leaders feeling? So it's really important that you have them take a little bit of an inventory and are you talking to them? We talked about this as well. How are you really feeling? Um, I know that many leaders that report to us have a lot of pride in their team that they've accomplished so much with COVID. There are also a lot of people that are exhausted. I think if we all take a self inventory, we are all very exhausted, stressed, overwhelmed about change. Think about our employees. They're always um, having to change the way they do things. So they're very stressed out. 
So our leaders naming their emotions. I think that most of us just try to ignore how we feel. You just keep moving on. That's not healthy. So what kind of counterproductive behaviors have we produced to be able to keep carrying on? And then no one is alone. So COVID is a marathon, not a sprint. We have to sprint, take a break. Sprint, take a break. That's what we have to do as leaders. And then we have these flyers all over our hospital that says it's okay to not be okay. That is counterintuitive how we've been raised. All of us, if you're okay, you're okay. No, we're not okay. None of us are okay. We're trying to figure it all out. Um, so we need to make sure that we talk, talk to our employees and to our leaders to make sure that they're able to vocalize or verbalize what it is that they're feeling. Avoid flavors of the week. That means today I'm going to focus on productivity. Tomorrow I'm focusing on repeat rate. The next day I'm focusing on, no. What are you focusing on? And make sure that your staff are very focused on the right things at all times. If you keep changing it up on them, they're going to get like overwhelmed. So it is very difficult to have in-person meetings. This is my first um, for a while. And even at our departments, we don't have in-person staff meetings. Like I said, you're only allowed to have so many people in a room. So it's very difficult to get enough people together to have meaning. I do rounding and that's how we communicate. But you need to foster a sense of community among your leaders. So making sure that you have the one-on-ones with them is very important. And then the short list of development priorities and then interventions. So if you have somebody that you know is not maybe portraying the organization in the way that you want, you're, you should be giving them the scripts. What do you want them to say? How are you going to make sure that they're carrying out the work that you want them to carry out? And then just encourage them to do frequent rounding as well. So the next thing we can do is just prepare our teams. And executives are right now making very difficult decisions. And some people I've heard say they have the highest volumes that they've ever had. In our facility, we have not recouped back to where we were. Um, so we're probably about a 15% less than where we were to start with. And it's just because you have limited, we haven't opened up yet. So you, know, you have limited number of people that are in your waiting rooms. You, you can't get back to where you, you were before. So a lot of difficult decisions are being made as far as are you, you know, below censusing staff whenever it's not busy? Are you making them use PDO, that kind of thing? And you just have to be ready to focus, how am I going to preserve my staff? So it could be that you need to make your staff more flexible, cross-training them, um, making them ready to that. It could be that they only had to be in one um, clinic and now you're going to make them rotate it through a couple. And then have a dual focus on continuing to navigate COVID-19 and advancing the strategic plan. So it could be you start a new project on top of you're already overwhelmed with COVID. And we're, we're currently going to put in a new CAT scanner. We're going to start some new procedures. And I think my team's going to be a little bit overwhelmed with that. So we're going to have to work really hard to get them engaged and buy in and, and see the value of it. And then making sure that we use diversity, inclusion, and health equity as our lens for everything that we do. I know that that's a, a very hot talking point right now to make sure that you're inclusive and you know, you're being diverse, but also just we have a fast paced decision making um, time going on right now. So it's okay to say, I don't know, but as soon as I know and I can share the information, I will. So are you pre preparing your leaders to deliver tough messages, be human centered, empathetic, and have an understanding of inclusion and belonging? So avoid implicit bias. Be aware that because of how we were raised, we may not know that we have biases against something. It's a stereotype about a, a group or an individual just because we, we don't know any better. So have a willingness to deliver honest moments. And you see the lips that are sugar-coated. There's a lot of people that don't want to have the hard, difficult um, conversations because they feel like it's going to decrease morale and or you know, el eliminate engagement. So you need to make sure that everybody's prepared to have that talk. And then what shadows are leaders casting? Are they present? It's just a natural thing for people to kind of run away and try to not be present as much because it's, it's easier to not be present. Teach self-awareness and emotional regulation. Role play topics with your leaders. Foster social support, which means be there. And then address stress management as a leadership competency. It's okay to say you're not okay. And whenever we're talking about 
anything that's social support. If your team has lost someone or you know they're going through a hard time, and I know that you don't want to be friends, unquote, you know, friends, but you do have to be um, friends with them. You have to send them cards. You have to send them texts. You have to be there for them because it's their lives, and they're spending more time with you than they are their families. Address stress management as a leadership competency and in bad behaviors. It's not okay for crap to run downhill. And then define the culture that you want and live it. And don't you be the bad culture that you're taking to work every day. So how can we develop, develop resilience? It's to stay open-minded, to make sure that we're making the best out of the worst situation. Don't jump to conclusions. And then brainstorm solutions with your team, actually meeting with them to make sure that you can find the best ideas or solutions to the problem. And then the next thing is practice patience and kindness, and that includes to yourself. I don't know about you guys, but I am my own worst critic. I'm probably a perfectionist at heart, and there's no room for perfectionism when you're a leader because you're just going to redo, do, redo, and you're going to be asking your team to do all this. So you just have to make sure that you're kind and listen to what your team has to say. Be optimistic, have fun, what you're grateful for, your friends, your family, your coworkers, whatever it is, make sure that you're focusing on that daily. That builds resilience. And then focus on the now. Don't get too engaged in what happened before. The past is gone, it's done, you can't undo it. So what did you learn from it? Move on, learning from your mistakes. Build great relationships. So five, you have good values, relationships. What team do you have? Do you have a network of people that you trust, trust and can talk to? And it's really important that you have somebody you can celebrate with. So y'all have a one inch piece of paper in front of you. These might be covered up. Yep, little square, little square. What I want you to do is in that little square, write the people in your lives that you have that are backing you. They love you even though you're at your worst sometimes. They love you no matter what. They are the people that are there for you and they're the ones that will tell you the hard things that you maybe don't wanna hear, but it's really important that you hear. So write, fill, write it on your one inch square. As many people as you want. So this, this little exercise was to kind of show you that there are a lot of people that are support you. There are maybe some people that only write one name in the box or two names and you have a lot of white space and that's okay. We keep our, keep our circles tight sometimes because that's who you can trust. So just remember these names because here in a little bit you're gonna have to think about them. It's awesome to be cared for and just remember that you're always cared for. So we have to practice self-care, good work-life balance, I am probably the most horrible example of good work-life balance because I had tried to give 100% to my work and I give 100% to my family and I do it probably 24 seven. And that's really difficult to balance because you don't give time for yourself. But I've been working on that. Has anybody read or listened to Brene Brown, Dare to Lead? It's an excellent book. And there's something that resonated with me the other day. I've actually started an audio book. I commute about 30 minutes a day, one way there and one way back, um, so about an hour total. So I listened to this book. And she says, the, most people think the opposite of work is play, but the problem is the opposite of play is depression. So how much time do we have we carved out for play? And that doesn't mean veg vegging on the couch. <laughs> it means what are you doing to feed your soul? What are you doing, whether it's you know kayaking or taking a hike or just doing whatever it is that gives you joy. So self-care is very crucial to resilience and that's something that you really need to, everybody needs to think about and focus on. So the last year of my life in a nutshell, I'm gonna tell you some really personal things that's happened. 
And I have been the poster child with a smile on, us, on my face. I'm okay, it's okay, everybody's okay. You know, but there's, there's a lot that's been going on. So it all started in November of 2019. I had a 180 degree labrum tear in my shoulder and a, a rotator cuff tear. So I had a flat procedure, rotator cuff repair. And I was in that nice little brace for about six weeks total that I couldn't move. I was like this. And um, my husband had to help me get dressed. He had to, I had to wait till he got home so I could take a shower. I was self-sufficient, but not. He had to pretty much do everything for me. Um, I couldn't feed myself. I had to learn how to do everything left-handed. I'm right-handed. It was very troubling. And I don't know if anybody's ever gone through a shoulder repair, but it is not an easy surgery. Babies are easy compared to having a shoulder repair. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, my daughter had to come out at Christmas time. I had poor timing on when I got injured and when I had to have the surgery. So it was just a bad thing all around. So that was first. The next thing COVID hit in March of 2020, um, that's when it hit West Virginia. So all of a sudden, our culture changed a little bit. My mother-in-law had been in a nursing home for four years and we visited her. My husband went every day. I went a couple times a week. So all of a sudden we had to go to Zoom calls. That's her in the upper left-hand corner of this picture. And you know, we all got our families together and we make sure that we were able to talk to her. And we were, we were surviving. That's how we were making it through. My parents um, were also home and they're in their 80s also. So we were delivering food to them and making sure that they didn't go out or try and keep everybody safe. So our culture is very tight knit. Um, that's just family and friends on the left really weren't celebrating much, just got together one day. Over here on the right is Christmas. Um, great, great nieces, great nephews, my nieces, nephews, my brother, sister, you know, my mom, dad, everybody. So that's the norm for us. So we always get together. So then on um, May 28th at uh, about 10 o'clock, I got a call from my mom telling me my dad was really sick. So I went to the house and he was actually physically on the floor in the bedroom because he couldn't get up, he was too weak. So got him up and um, called a friend and he helped me because I couldn't lift him with my arm. So we got him in a wheelchair, got him loaded, took him to the hospital and my dad had COVID and we have no idea how he got it. So my mom had COVID, my dad had COVID. Um, my brother, was with me whenever I took my dad to the hospital because he had a heart cath the day before and um, he had a hematoma and they thought he might have had a, you know, a pseudo aneurysm or something like that going on. So my house, my car was loaded when I took him to the hospital. So my brother was exposed, I was exposed and my mom and dad had it. And so we were immediately tested. My brother and I were, were um, negative. And, but of course that was our baseline. And then my dad was admitted directly to ICU that night, and but he was, seemed to be doing okay. And then I got the call on Friday saying that things went bad. They had to intubate him on Friday and that they were proning him, trying to get him through it and everything. So, you know, we knew things weren't very good with my dad because um, he had some probably lung scarring. He was a, an auto diesel mechanic and he also um, was just end of and getting the end of life you know we knew he was kind of going downhill so on sunday night um, i got the call again from the hospital the hospitalist called me to tell me that um, they had coded him twice he wasn't going to make it they called my mom my mom couldn't decide what to do and i'm like what well, doesn't sound like there's really a choice here if you can't bring him back then you can't bring him back so they called me 10 minutes later to say that he'd passed away so i packed my stuff up and i knew i was going to go stay with my mom by that time, I'd already developed a fever and I knew I was getting COVID because I was exposed. <laughs> and I was in the car with him for 45 minutes and we had no idea that's what was wrong with him. So um, I went to my mom's and this is kind of how we handled things, Zoom calls again, because I'm quarantined, my mom's quarantined, my brother's quarantined. Um, nobody could come see us or anything. This is how we also made our funeral arrangements was by Zoom calls. and it was just kind of a very awkward, sticky mess. We couldn't go to the funeral home. We couldn't do viewings. We, nobody could come to the house. You know, nobody could really do anything. So that was kind of nasty. Um, so the next thing was the day of the funeral. We were able to go to the funeral because it was outside. And then this is a picture of my niece and 
two nieces actually, and three great nieces. She brought her banjo, they're out there playing. And that's a picture of my nephew, um, Brandon. He was basically raised at my parents' house because they are very nearby. And my dad would always get him since he was a baby, like nine months old, he was standing up in the car seat in front against the law, but that's what he did. Brought him up, you know, he, so he, he was raised at our house all the time. So regarding my COVID experience, I had um, fever for 30 days. And then finally at day 31, my fever went away. I tested negative day 32. I was able to return to work on day 35. I was able to work from home. My work was kind of supportive, but kind of not because I chose to go stay with my mom for every day that I was with her, COVID positive, it was 14 more days before I could even test, but I already knew I had it, so it really didn't matter <laughs> to me. I didn't care, nobody else could be with her. So then on the morning, 5 a.m. on August 29th, I got a call from my brother telling me that my nephew was killed in a side-by-side, -side, which is kind of like a four-wheeler. Um, he had rolled it over the night before, they found him in the middle of the night. At five, he called me to let me know and wanted me to go tell my mom. So I had to go tell my mom that, you know, he had passed away. And the worst part was that Brandon's 11-year-old daughter was at my mom's, stayed all night that night. So I had to break the news to her too. So then in October, I told my husband, we are going on vacation and we're going to stay for two weeks. So we did. So we went to Inglewood Beach, Florida. I don't know if y'all have been there before. It is beautiful. And it was time for me to like restore myself. That's, that's why I was there. And this is a picture of us that we took the day before they left. And this is my, and you already introduced all my family and that's my son's girlfriend. So while we were at our trip, my girl, my, his girlfriend, um, she was coughing. And I said to her, hey, you've been coughing for a really long time. I was in, I think it was in Florida in May and she had a cough. Then they came up for, for my nephew's funeral and she had a cough. So here we are, October, she's still coughing. And I said, you need to go to the doctor. And she said, well, I was at the doctor. They gave me Singulair. I said, practice with me. I have a cough. I have symptoms. I need a chest X-ray. So she did that. She practiced with me. She went back. She had her chest X-ray. And when they did the chest X-ray, they first told her that it was normal. And then a week later, she called him again. And she said, I'm still having these symptoms. My cough's getting worse. And they said, well, the chest x-ray showed a little bit of widening of the media sinum. So why don't you go in and get a CAT scan? So I had already lost faith of her physician at that point. So I said, get a CD of your images and we'll zoom tonight and I'll look at your images. So you share your screen. So this was me with my iPhone. I've got my you know, video going. And I immediately noticed as soon as you know, the APC started showing the media sinum was huge. And so I knew that we had a big problem. And I didn't know exactly what it was, obviously, but I knew it was bad. Also, this image, um, there's no contrast in it. It was supposed to be an enhanced chest. And I'm like, um, did they get an IV to you? And it, she was like, yeah. And I'm like, does your arm hurt? Yeah, it's a little puffy. I'm like, okay, great. You know, I knew she had an infiltrate. They didn't even catch it. Um, so I took the, the CD or I took the video from my iPhone to work with me the next day, found my radiologist. And as soon as I started showing him the images, he started cussing. And he said, you need to call her right now, tell her to get to the emergency room. Her um, trachea is less than five millimeters. She's in, in danger of losing her airway. So I called her up, she was at work that morning. And um, I said, you need to go to the ER, she was resistant. I was like, you don't really have a choice. You need to go home, get your CD, get Cody, go to the ER. So she said, well, I don't even know where to go. So I Googled um, Orlando's best lymphoma hospital. <laughs> how, do you, how do you even decide where to tell somebody to go? She didn't know what to do. So I found a hospital that was ranked number one. I said, I said, okay, so go there. And um, she went and they were kind of like made light of her when she got there. She's very stoic. You would have any, you would have no idea that she was as sick as she was. Once they started looking at the CDs, you know, they knew immediately that she was in bad shape. So she was admitted. Um, she was in there for about a month and they did a PET scan and she had stage three classic Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so that was New Year's Eve when she finally, after having a bronchogram where they took tissue, it was dead. Then they did a CT guided biopsy and they didn't get a good tissue sample. So they actually had to open her up to get sample to be able to diagnose her. So New Year's Eve when she was diagnosed, given that, and, you know, I was like, it's okay, we'll figure it out. You know, it was, it was the chunky kind. It was the 10 by seven mass is what she had. So 
Um, she just had a PET scan two weeks ago. She's just finished. Today is number eight of her chemotherapy. And I'm really the only medical person she has because her family, her mother passed away with breast cancer several years ago and her dad lives in Texas and um, he's, he's not medical at all. So she asks me for questions, you know, answers all the time. I, I can only say, do what they tell you to do. Um, and she's doing, she's doing really well. Her PET scan showed um, no recurrent lymphoma, but she does have a new mass in her left APC. So we're not sure what that is. We're gonna do a biopsy. So next in March, um, my, my mother-in-law passed away. And the good news was this, I'm sorry, she passed away in January. Um, so the good news was in December, she had COVID, she recovered and she was doing really well, but still nobody was able to visit. And in January, she had a UTI, was admitted to the hospital and my husband and his, his sister, their, their, her daughter and son were able to go visit her. It was the first time anybody had visited her for like seven months. So they were actually able to see her. And then that was the great thing because he was able to FaceTime people when, and um, she was like the best she'd been in years. So when she passed away, it was devastating to our family, but we knew that you know she was in a better place. So it, it was a little bit easier to accept for me. So our family has been stretched and tragically bent, but not broken. And that's the best way I can say it and how, because we have to be resilient. So whenever you have tragedy, Obviously you have sadness, hopelessness, anger, fear, grief, under unanswered questions, sometimes hate, cynicism, sarcasm, and eventually memories that you treasure forever. And the cynicism and sarcasm, that was something that I developed early and I knew it and I had to check myself at the door every day before I went into work because you can't bring that kind of stuff to work, you know? So what I've learned, it's okay to take time for yourself it's okay to say no. If you don't really want to do something, you don't. Um, if you have relationships that are toxic, cut them off. You don't need that in your life. Enjoy a guilt-free, lazy day. That's my favorite. On um, Saturdays, you will often see me in my nightgown and I am not leaving the house and I'm not doing anything that day. I deserve that. Um, and then prioritize your inner peace. And it is so important to not like dwell on negative things because it's just going to really you know, bring you down and, and it's not going to be anything that's going to help you. So the next thing we're going to do is in your packet, in the um, positive psychology packet on page seven, there's actually a door closed, door open exercise that I want you to do. It's the top thing that you have there. We're just going to take a couple minutes for you to think about what things have happened in your life that initially you thought was just horrible, but maybe you learned something from.
So I think most of you have finished up on this. So for me, what I learned was I needed to open up, whether it was to my family, to my coworkers, and then even to my employees to develop a closer relationship. If I didn't share what I was going through, then they, they didn't really know how to help me. And then also I became more of a human being than just a director to my employees because I also had some things that I had to go through. So if I hadn't shared with them, I don't think that they would have really expected me to um, have a heart. <laughs> and I think that they didn't think that I was a human being, I was a robot. So as I was talking to them about things, you know, they'd cry, they would you know, share things about themselves with me and that really allowed us to open up to each other. So that was what happened with me with my door open, door closed. So I don't know what, if anybody wants to share anything. Go ahead. So, you can throw into the best part or the worst part. Yeah. Go ahead. Very good. <laughs> so the U.S. Army Training Manual on Survival, they actually give us, people don't rise to the occasion, they default to their level of training. So that's why scripts are important, like we talked about, and actually role playing and having, having people train. But for S, it's sur size up the situation, your surroundings, know where, where you are and what you're doing. You, undo haste makes waste, stay calm. R, remember where you are. V, vanquish fear and panic. These are very dangerous things to have to survive. Improvise, use the tools you have. Value living, be stubborn about it. Even if you don't really want to get up the next morning, you get up every day. A, act like the natives. Be with your people, know what they do. You have to actually be researching them whenever you're living with them. And then L, live by your wit, but for now learn basic skills. So I'm not trying to minimize U.S. Army's survival, but I think metaphorically, we have all done this as far as getting through at our, at our hospitals, and our facilities. So the two grave dangers, according to U.S. Army, are the desire for comfort and then a passive outlook. So the desire for comfort, that is not a necessity. 
comfort's nice, but you don't have to have it. And then be strong and check your attitude, like I kind of talked about earlier. So I did have a passive outlook. I basically was getting by. I was numb, and I didn't want to feel. So what do you do? Um, whenever you think about compassion fatigue, our front end user, our front line people are giving care. But for me, I was caring for my family. And I was putting myself last at every moment because I had to. Somebody had to do what they had to do when they did it. And you know, you, I think about my people that are taking care of, of others and putting themselves at, at harm's way. You know, you could catch COVID, you could take it home to your grandma or whatever. Um, so the individuals affected by compassion fatigue are unable to deliver highest quality care and are at risk for burnout. So you actually have a packet that um, is for compassion fatigue and that's on the bottom. So to successfully build frontline staff's emotional capacity and decrease the likelihood of compassion fatigue and burnout, organizations should adopt a pro proactive approach for demonstrating emotional support. But you have to assess your employees. Are they at that risk? Do they have compassion fatigue? We don't know. So I want you all to take this real quick. It's just a, it, it's, you just answer the questions. And whenever you're doing the compassion fatigue, it is, there's invisible and visible. And when you're doing it on yourself, you want to do both sides, invisible and visible. So go ahead. So you can go ahead and start adding up all of your yeses. So when the advisory board sent this out a couple months ago and I took this um, test myself personally, I had several yeses on the invisible side that, you know, if you want to be honest about it, uh, you know, if a meeting got canceled, maybe you were personally very excited. You know, if, if you went home and you just didn't know how effective you were, like just blah feeling. So at that time I knew I had to make some changes. And 
So this says zero to two, no cause for immediate concern, three to five, investigate the root cause, and then six to 18, seek additional professional counseling. Well, I have not seeked professional counseling, but I probably should have a while back. So you can't pour from an empty cup. And that's something that, you know, everybody knows that. But taking care of yourself, and you can't be resilient if you're not healthy, mentally and emotionally, or emotionally and physically. Um, so stop hiding your, you have to stop hiding your vulnerabilities and open up to others. And you have to build relationships. So again, your little circle, your square, who are you confiding in? So you, whenever I started talking to my employees, they did see me through new eyes. Self-care is not selfish, it's necessary. And that's really important for all of us as leaders. If you can't, you're no good to your, your people if you aren't healthy. And then today is the day to make a change. And I challenge each of you to like really start focusing on yourself. So you need a replenishment plan. Leaders have limitations and you get tired, but you deny it. So you can't do everything. Again, we talk, sprint, take a break. We, know, we aren't taking those breaks and, and making sure that we're get, developing the areas that help us be more resilient. So number one is physical. Maybe it's just nap or go to bed earlier. Last week, I went to bed at nine o'clock, two nights. I never do that. I'm like a night owl, but I was just exhausted. So, you know, sometimes you just have to do that. Emotionally, how am I supporting myself? Call a close friend, text a friend, um, watch a movie. It says, see a counselor. Number three, intellectual. I need one day a week where I don't stare at a, at a computer screen. And I need to like, I, like I told you, the audio books. I've been also doing some podcasts. Something to stimulate your brain. And then spiritually. I need to carve out 30 minutes a day. I'm not good at that. Um, but I really need to start taking time, ride a bike, do something to get outside and enjoy nature, meditate, pray, whatever that brings you the, the peace that you need. So you guys have the little circles on your pieces of paper and it's define your replenishment plan. What are you gonna do to start taking better care of yourself? So you need to fill that out, put your name in it because you're gonna put this on your refrigerator at home and you're gonna hold yourself accountable that you're gonna do this. So think about it, when you get back, what are you gonna to do to take better care of yourself? Physically, what are you gonna do? Emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually. Just have a couple minutes to fill that out. And then you have to share. So here's my replenishment plan that I started working on a couple months ago. So I joined Belly Buster Boot Camp. Let me tell you, what a joy. It was with my niece, and um, we were running suicides up a hill, and um, we were doing jump, jumping jacks, jump rope. We were doing all kinds of crunches. I did 100 crunches in one night. I didn't think I could do that kind of stuff. But when you stimulate yourself physically, your, 
mental just clears. So it is really important to do something physical. So that was mine. And I'm going to continue. Um, emotional, I've already said, sharing feelings. I'm not real good about sharing myself, but I've been working on that. Spiritual prayer meditation. Meditation is something that I am not good at because it, you have to calm down, center yourself. Um, and you probably can tell that I'm a little bit of a hyper person, but I'm working on that. And then intellectual, like I said, audiobooks, podcasts. So now's your turn. Who wants to share? Yeah. Cool. That's good. Anybody else want to share? Right, right. Uh, spiritual, uh, you know, I like study and do all that kind of thing. Uh, and intellectual, and it's more cognitive. Good. Anybody else want to share? Okay. I would say physical, although it's faster to do more time at home. Training. Yep. Right. And for me, that's important. I would say spiritual, yeah, that whole time to meditate and that thing, that, that would be a struggle for sure. Intellectual, trying to stop working long enough to do a book of pages that I have to do. And I have to say that since I've been a teacher in Florida, I've made my Yeah. Emotional. Uh, I've had about the year you had. So allowing myself the time to feel those emotions and try to center myself. Try to do the thing. Yeah. And not very effective, but I need to work on that as well. Okay. Very good. So take these home and put them on your refrigerator. Hold yourself accountable to take care of yourself. So breathing. A lot of people say, take the slow, deep breaths. It'll calm you down. No, that's really not the secret. The secret is breathing through your heart. And that sounds silly because you can't breathe through your heart, but it's abdominal breathing. So we're going to go ahead and do an exercise right now. So taking a deep breath. Exhale. Once again, big, deep breath in. Exhale. Now, how'd that make you feel? It relaxes you. It centers you. It just like makes you feel, okay. So you really need to be conscious because we do hold our breath. For some reason, when we're stressed, we are not taking big breaths. So it's, re it's rhythmically even and through the heart every day. You need to take time to do that. So Les Brown, he had it all going on here. Your thoughts create your reality. Practice positive thinking. Act the way you want to be, and soon you'll be the way you act. So fake it till you make it. So, yeah, so with the breathing, with the calmness, with the positive thoughts, we really have to change our thinking to change our life. And this has really got me through. Be with those who bring out the best in you, not the stress in you. So I have taken this one to heart. If I'm on the phone with someone, say, I don't think anyone on my family will be listening to this podcast. <laughs> 
but if I'm on the phone with someone who brings out the stress, the negativity or whatever, I try to refocus. I try to get them back on the positive. But if they can't get to the positive, all of a sudden I got to get off that phone. I'm really sorry. I got to go. I'll talk to you later. Love you. Bye. You know, and that's how I survive that at work. If somebody comes and they want to just hunker down and tell you everything that's bad about whatever. OK, I'll listen. Well, what are we going to do to fix that? If they don't have solutions and they're not really there to help make things better, all of a sudden I am standing up and I'm walking out the door and they're standing up and they're confused and they're walking out the door. It works like a charm every time. It, and you just walk out the hallway and they walk out the hallway and then you go the opposite direction. You come back to your office and you get some work done. I'm not going to let somebody steal my time if they don't really want to make improvements. So on the phone, same thing, you know, it works. Just really be careful about who takes your time. So defining how you feel, what are your feelings right now? There's a piece of paper that helps you do this. And I don't know that this one's quite so important, but what are you feeling right now? Feel the energy in your body and describe it. Maybe you have one new shoes and you have your pinky toe uh, pinched or something, or maybe um, you have, some, maybe you're feeling something right now is just overwhelming, or maybe you have something that's gnawing at your heart. You just don't know what to do. The really important thing to do is label it. What is it? And then, okay. How am I going to fix this? So recentering yourself, thinking about what am I going to do to overcome this obstacle? And then you need to get to a positive state. So it's easier said than done, but you can do it. When you look at this, most of us want to live on the left side. The left side is a positive emotion. And, you know, it's where you're passionate, you're motivated, you're enthusiastic. When something bad happens, whenever you have, you know, like the year like we've had, um, on the right side, it's the negative emotion and your body is releasing cortisol and that is what affects your autoimmune disease. It makes you sick. It's the root of basically every illness, cancer, all that. So cortisol is really bad for you. So it's the negative emotion and you've heard of people that are born to bitch. They just constantly, it's because they're stuck on that right side. It's that complain cycle. It's a rut and they just, they have negative thoughts. Then the cortisol is released and that makes them more have, have more negative thoughts. And it just keeps you over there on that right side. And it could be that you're detached. So even if you're not actively being negative, but if you're unattached, you're not attentive, you're lazy, you're lethargic, whatever the, the negative part is, if that's where you're stuck, you're still on the negative side and you're still releasing cortisol. So it's really important to take those deep breaths. Okay, this is going to be a good, get, good day after all. Get yourself, just this deep breath bring you to the center. So then the next thing is to move to the left side. And the DHEA is the anti or the opposite of cortisol. It's what releases the good thoughts into your body. DHEA is what makes you feel euphoric, the passion, the, the motivated. Um, and it's okay, the content, receptive, and interested. It's just okay to be also. You don't have to be active. You can be positive and just happy to be. And that's over on the left-hand lower side. So venting, it's really important that you only vent to those you trust because somebody might have an ulterior motive and they're going to use it against you. So go to your little square box because those are the people that you can trust on life things that you want to vent to. That's who you can trust to, to talk to. So find your Vegas. Who can you trust? Make sure you choose the right people and make sure that you're not venting to be negative. You're just venting to blow off steam, but you're not going to stay on that right side. You're actually going to move back over to the happy side, to the left side. So refrain from venting to employees. It is not okay to share your negative thoughts about work with your employees. And then make sure that you find a mentor. Maybe it's another department, or maybe it's um, an objective listener. That's somebody that you would want to have a Vegas with that you can talk to, and they're, you're going to trust them. The attitude of gratitude is an act, and it's very much a chosen path to go down. You can choose to be joyous grateful, or you can choose to be not. <laughs> um, so part of being resilient is being grateful. Neuroscientists have found that participating in frequent acts of gratitude can rewire your brain. There's a part of your brain that wants to be rewired, but if you don't use it, then you're not going to be grateful and you're not going to be resilient. So regular acts elevate the physical mental health boost, makes you be happier, it improves your sleep and it helps you content with other people. You can actually want to be with other people because you're grateful that you're with them. So gratitude is not intended to minimize hardships. It helps you manage tough times. 
So whenever I'm going through my negative things with my family, I was still grateful that I had my family that, that was surrounding me. And that's what gave me, you know, the pause, the, the help to stay there in a positive state. And somewhere between real challenge and happiness is gratefulness. It's right in the middle. So the most resilient people are very happy and pliable. Have you ever met a grouchy, resilient person? You cannot be grouchy and resilient in the same time. They are negative. They are stuck in that rut. <laughs> the level of your resilience will be found at the frequency, how often you're, you're grateful. So what is gratitude? It's the quality of being thankful, readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness. So you have a piece of paper that is in the past seven days, how many people have you shown gratitude to? How many of these people were different than you? So this is talking about the biases that we have inside of ourselves. It's very easy to be grateful to someone who's like us, but sometimes it's, it's a little bit more challenging if you look at somebody and you think they're not like me and I don't know if I should be thankful or grateful or not. You know, it just, it's implicit bias. It's who we are. And then one thing to keep in mind, I thought about this whenever we were over in the other room talking today, but remote work has eroded trust among colleagues and increased the possibility of bias. So you believe what you believe based on that tiny snapshot that you see in your little you know, webinars or meetings that you're having and you're not getting that connection. So it's something to really, if you have people who work remotely, it's something that you really need to work on to make sure that they are feeling connected and they've not eroded that trust. So when somebody looks different than you, you see this person here all padded out and then you see them over in the next one and they're dressed professionally. Would you treat them differently if they did the same act of kindness of, of held the door for you or they you know, picked up something? Or, like, I think that sometimes if you see someone, maybe the, you know, the, the person who's got the hoodie on, you know, are they going to rob me? What are, what are they doing? And then you see him over here and he's dressed in a, a very professional dress. It's, we automatically assume things based on what we see. And we just have to be very careful and aware of, of how we're feeling. So how do we do that? One is just you make the observation. My, your mind makes the interpretation of whatever it is. You might have to change your mindset. Be aware. Pause. Add a seven-second pause because that seven seconds is what's going to help you refocus your brain. And then gratitude is an intentional act. It's a behavior that you have to choose to make. So if you don't put that pause in there, you're probably not going to choose to show gratefulness. Know that how we hear things is not the same. How people think is very different. So when you're showing gratitude, you have to know how people think. Most of us have one to two dominant quadrants in our brain to receive and deliver um, gratitude. And the disruptor, that line that where we add our seven second pause, it's create a shared trust, respectful empathy, connected understanding, and significant emotional event or relationship. So all of us have different parts of the brain, and normally we have um, one to two that were more dominant. I'm definitely left brain dominant. I know that about myself. I'm logical, analytical, fact-based, quantitative, sequential, organized, detailed, planned. Then there's other people who are more on the right side, the holistic, intuitive, integrating, synthesizing, interpersonal, feeling-based, kinesthetic, and emotional. So you have to kind of recognize that all of us are wired differently. So whenever we're showing gratitude or receiving gratitude, depending on how we're wired, we're going to look at this. And if I'm logical, I need to make sure that if I'm giving it to someone who maybe is over on the emotional side, I want to make it personal. I want to communicate. I want to be authentic. Where for me, I want it to be clear. Don't beat around the bush and let's be ready with facts. So you have to balance that with your gratitude, making sure that you're aware of how your people are. Kurt, you have something to add? <laughs> Showing gratitude. So it's not just, oh, I feel for you. It's imagine that someone doesn't have on a different pair of shoes, but that you're actually wearing their shoes. So they're taking off their dirty hiking boots and they're going to put on those high heels and you're going to walk around in those shoes. It's imagining yourself in that and feeling for them. You can feel what they feel. 
And then empathy and gratitude are absolutely connected. And that's, that's kind of a new thought for me because empathy is, oh, I feel, how can you be grateful and empathy? It's because you have to understand them and be grateful for them before you can actually make that connection. Everybody has a different way that they want to receive gratitude. So it might be that you want the big hoopla, the award ceremony, or you might just want a personally you know, written thank you note. So it's important that you know your people and how they want to receive the gratitude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is amazing how we're all so different. So cultivate gratitude. Write down one thing that makes you happy today. You still have a little bit of time. You have a piece of paper that has it all spelled out. Write down one thing that makes you happy today. Just use two more words to describe that. You're learning how to journal gratefulness, by the way. That's what we're doing right now. And then write down one thing that someone else did that was kind today. I don't know if you saw, but John actually took my plate that was dirty and took it down to the end. That was very kind of him to do today. And what's one thing that you did for someone else? Maybe it was you said thank you. Maybe you held a door. You know, what, what is it that you've done that was kind? And then write down five things that you're thankful for. I can tell you right off the bat, I'm thankful for my husband, my family. I'm thankful that there's sun in the sky, that you know I have um, friends that I rely on. I'm thankful for a car that gets me wherever. Like you think about it, if you start thinking my dog, you, know, you think about all these things that you're thankful for, it perks you up. So if every day you make the conscious decision to be grateful and you write it down and then you just start journaling, and then if you're starting to feel bad about something, you can go back to your journal and that's supposed to help perk you back up. But you're also rewiring your brain because if you're grateful about something, then it's going to help you be more grateful every day. So I want you to write down every day, try to do this, try to get through this exercise for the next week and, and hopefully it will help rewire your brain. So focus on your powers, not your helplessness. The greatest power that anyone has is the capacity to change. And you can certainly experience happy moments without resilience, but in order to have a happy life, you have to be resilient. So stressful situations that leaders undergo, I just wrote down a few that I feel are very stressful. Terminating an employee is the worst. I hate terminating an employee, it's very stressful. I mean, I even cried during one of my terminations because I just felt so bad to let the person go. You know, and you put yourself in other people's shoes sometime, you know that they don't have anything else to fall back on, but they chose that. So you have to remember that terminating employee, they terminated themselves. Um, wearing armor, it is very exhausting to work in a job where you're all like tight up, tightened and you're just thinking, I can't be me because they don't, they, I don't know what they want. I had a new administrative team and they came in a couple years ago and they're great, but it was me. My response to them was, oh my goodness, what are they gonna do? I don't know, they're right sizing, they're downsizing, am I gonna make it? I don't know if I'm gonna make it. I'm doing all these things in my head and I'm wearing this armor because I'm just prepared. And I was doing that, I had to let my armor down to see myself and all of a sudden the stress went away. So it, it, I realized that that was me. Being disingenuous, you have to be yourself. So it's stressful to not be. Not knowing how to answer specific questions. You're not a fortune teller. It's okay to say, I don't know. And then multitasking and being the master of none, or maybe just a few. If you have a bunch of balls in the air, it is exhausting. They're going to fall. And then you're going to be so hard on yourself. So prioritize and do one thing at a time. 
So mindful meditation is something where it's a little bit more than just taking in a deep breath and blowing it out. It's actually, I'm going to take in a deep breath and I'm going to focus on your hair. I know this sounds crazy. You might feel where your hair attaches or you might feel your nose or you might feel your ears and you're concentrating on, you're doing a mind sweep and you're trying to feel different parts of your body. I have been practicing this because it really does relax you and it does make you more aware and it does calm you. So you can you know, be less reactive and you can be more present in the moment if you just take some time. They recommend that you do this 20 minutes a day, but you have to remember that this is something that you have to work up to. So you train your brain and it helps you observe. The observer self is the brain that says, okay, this is what you're thinking and you shouldn't be thinking this right now. So the more that you meditate and the more that you train your brain, you're recognizing I'm focusing on bad things instead of happy things. And, and that's the observer self. It helps you to live a consistent life with your values. It calms you down. And then the one thing that research it shows is there's no difference between the mind and the body. So if you have an, a, a mind at unrest, your body is, at, at, is working overtime too. So you need to make sure that you're trying to balance yourself and turn off the fight or flight and turn on the rest and digest. And that is how you de-risk against everything. Meditation is proven to actually do that for your body. So whenever you're doing mindful practices, it might be you can only do it for a minute because that's all your mind can handle. You have to train your brain to do this. It's just like lifting weights. You're not gonna go to a gym and expect to lift hundred pounds when I'm a weakling. Um, you know, I'm going to have to start at 20, 30, 40, work my way up. It's the same thing with whenever you're trying medi mindful meditation. You're going to have to just train for, you know, one, one minute at a time and just start adding on. Other things that are really helpful for your, for your uh, single-minded activities helps to get, make you be mi more mindful. The chess, puzzles, coloring, yoga, sewing, anything, gardening is very relaxing to me. So you have another exercise. We're not going to do it, but it's in your book. And it's describe the challenging life event, identify reasons to get through the challenge, identify values, and staying in touch with your values. There's a whole list of values in there, and it helps you to recognize um, what's important to you, and then to make sure that whenever you're trying to make decisions, it helps you balance. Um, why would I make that decision when that, that's not one of my values? So you can see that in your booklet. It's on page 12 to 14. What do we do to help our employees say that they love what they do and that they're, they're there and they're at their best? So it's really important to coach, train, develop, and you have to dig for them to admit how they feel. We've already talked about that. But once they do admit how they're feeling, then they're more open to make changes. So it's important for us to drive expectations and for us to help our caregivers to meet the expectations. We have to say, you know, I want you to have a 100% patient satisfaction score. Here's how we're going to get there. We're not going to get there, but I'm, I'm lucky to get to the 90th percentile and I'm very happy. But you know, you have to really start saying, here's what we're going to do. Here's the scripts I need you to say. Here's what I need you to, you know, tell them you're going to cover them up with the blanket to make them warm because I care about your comfort. Use all the key words so that when they fill out that press gaining survey, they're going to say, oh yeah, they did say that. So you're going to teach your teams to be at their best by telling them what you expect, making sure that they connect with their patients, um, collaborate, Cultivation of soaring. You want to make sure that the employee is like, I want to work here because they care about me. And how do you how do you make that? So you're making a mindful purpose of your life that I'm when I'm making my rounds, I want them to know that I care about them. And you want them to say, I'm going to stay here for life. I want to work here forever because I wouldn't want to work anywhere else. This is the place I want them to be. This is it. So belonging, making sure that you're succeeding is making your employees feel belonged that they belong there. So the dr three drivers of human contentment, mastery. I feel gr the best whenever I know what I'm doing. <laughs> if I don't know what I'm doing, I'm gonna feel very weak. Authenticity, living in accordance with your beliefs and your values, which was on that, that page 12 to 14. Um, belonging relationships, people love me and I love them. And then impact, I make a difference for others. I make the world a better place. So. You know, you see people, money, cars, big homes, they don't always make you happy. One of the statistics that I saw was a, prior to COVID, a physician committed suicide daily in the United States. One physician every day. That's a horrible, I mean, you would think about it. They have money, they have car, they have, they have whatever they want because money does not make you happy. You have to choose to be happy. So you can have happy moments without being resilient. 
resilience makes you happy. What is resilience? Perseverance isn't possible without it. The two traits go together. On any journey, and every goal is a journey, there will be setbacks. You'll make a mistake. Something unexpected will happen or circumstances will change. You have to be able to recover from these setbacks. That's what resilience is. Resilience is the ability to become strong again after something bad happens. Trees have it. They bend in strong winds, but then spring back to their original shape. Your body suffers from a virus. You feel terrible, but then your energy and strength return because your system is designed to be resilient. Your emotions need to be as strong. It's a vital element in human perseverance. Lynn, team leader in an event management company, worked hard on a plan for reorganizing her team. She got encouragement from her senior colleagues. She worked hard to create a presentation full of stats and graphs and well-worded reasoning. She was proud of her plan. On the day she presented it, an unexpected intervention from a board member undermined everything she argued for. She felt humiliated. She felt as if she no longer had a future at the company. After the meeting, she spoke to a colleague. She realized that there was a simple way to be resilient and deal with her disappointment. It was how people who suffered tragedies in wars or natural disasters got back onto their feet and continued their lives. They faced the facts squarely. Lynn took time to understand what happened wasn't her fault. She couldn't have predicted how the board member would have intervened, but it didn't mean that her career was over. She simply needed to try again with a new strategy. It wasn't as bad as she thought it was. Lynn knew that she could start again in better shape to succeed than before. And that's what she did. Lynn examined what had happened, learned lessons from it, and reshaped her plan. She bounced back. When she resubmitted the plan, it turned out that the negative board member had left the company and her new plan was adopted because it was better. Resilience is central to perseverance. By facing facts squarely, allowing time for recovery and bouncing back with an attitude of growth, it's possible to be resilient in the face of any setback. How many of you experienced that? So just a quick review, resilience is the ability to thrive despite adversity. Focus on today, practice gratitude, practice mindful meditation, and practice positive self-talk to get yourself through. Re resilience can be learned. It's not you were born with it or you weren't. You can teach yourself how to be more resilient. Stay connected to your values at all times. And then share your own vulnerabilities with your teams to make deeper connections. And that is all I have. <laughs> so, do you have any questions? I have never given a presentation on a soft topic, and that's exactly what this one was. Um, it was very challenging to share my own personal experiences, but also researching on something that's very like soft like this is very difficult. So, there's so many different theories on how to, you know, overcome adversities and everything. But if you start looking, you're going to find all kinds of research. So, hopefully, I provided you with the pamphlets and the the work that you can do for yourself to help.